Good afternoon, everyone. Um, and thank you all for joining us uh, for this second of three webinars that the VNA is running um, as part of our work to strengthen credibility in neuroscience. Um, this is uh, supported by the Gatsby Foundation, and I'm Madeline Lancaster, a group leader at the MRC Laboratory of Molecular Biology in Cambridge. Um, and I'm also a member of the BNA Credibility Advisory Board. Um, so for this series of webinars, we've uh, decided to focus on reproducibility and uh, robustness of in vitro neural models and what to consider in terms of uh, you know, best practices uh, and, and how to improve the reliability of these unique models. And so this second webinar will feature Eva Kilava. Um, who is a stellar postdoc in my lab here at the LMD and who will be telling us about how to make 3D models more reproducible. Um, so this is a topic very close to my own heart as well. And so Eva will give a short 15-minute uh, presentation uh, followed by time for questions. So if you do have any questions, uh, feel free to type them in the Q&A uh, tab at the bottom and then I'll, I can ask them at the end. And don't be shy. Um, uh, we'll have plenty of time uh, afterwards. And then the chat is for more general comments or issues if you have any sort of technical problems. Um, I should also say that the webinar will be recorded and it will be available afterwards on the BNA's YouTube channel for anybody who can't make it or who might want to go back and look at the talk for any reason. So with that, Eva, over to you. So thank you very much. Hello, everybody. Let me just share my screen. Can you see the island? Mm -hmm. Looks great. Excellent. Yeah, I know. I have no idea where it is, but it does look nice. <laughs> so hello, everybody, one more time. Uh, so as Madeline mentioned, I will just give you a very short talk about how we can make 3D models more reproducible. Uh, so I will constantly more, more on the, like the individual researchers or labs efforts to make their organoids more reproducible. And I will just mention briefly some of the potential community-based solutions that could improve re reproducibility in the whole field. So as Madeline again mentioned, we work on brain organoids, so I will give uh, examples from our field, but similar principles can be applied to models of other organ systems. So we have mentioned organoids today, we have also mentioned them last time. Okay, so, but what are they? As you can see in these images, they are first of all, very beautiful structures. So for example, this is a kidney organoid, this is a retinal organoid, this is a stomach organoid, but what are they? And here is a very simple, um, uh, kind of definition box telling you what we think organoids are and how they could be defined. And just in brief, so there are 3D structures that are grown in vitro and they resemble either an adult organ or they recapitulate major processes during the development of an organ. So what is necessary for them to be an organoid is to have multiple cell types. They have to be capable of recapitulating some specific functions of the organ or uh, some developmental processes during the development of the organ and they need to possess morphology that is very similar to the organ that they're trying to model. So in the last 10 years, uh, usage of organoids has exploded and currently they are um, very often a model of choice when we are studying human embryonic development where the in vivo tissue is difficult to obtain. And they're often uh, heavily used in drug discovery and therapeutic fields and over there their usage is really exponentially growing. So even though they are very increasingly popular, they're not always needed. So the very important question is actually, do I need organoids in my research? And another important question there that you need to answer is, depends on the question. So we often get asked to make organoids and researchers often think they need to make organoids and reviewers often, often demand organoids. But sometimes this very complex in vitro model is actually not needed. So the choice of your in vitro method is dependent on your scientific question. And one really has to take into account all the pros and cons of all the methods that are available to us. So when it comes to um, neural development, the simplest in vitro culture is ne our neural stem cells, so NSCs. And they're very, very homogeneous, uh, but that renders them also quite simple. However, they are an excellent choice for very targeted approaches, especially in drug screens, um, where they are very, very useful. And actually several of these methods can be used during the same project. It just really depends on the specific process which is addressed. So just to show that even with relatively, with much simpler um, uh, in vitro systems, you can ask very complicated, you can answer very complicated questions. Here is a paper that was published in 2016. So in this study, the authors used 2D neural rosettes, so a relatively simple uh, and homogeneous uh, system to study the differences between the developmental timing of neuronal production between humans, macaques and chimpanzees. 
And what was amazing in this paper that the differences that we observe in vivo are clearly recapitulated in vitro in the 2D rosette system. So uh, even though many research questions can be addressed with relatively simple models, some questions do require the complexity of brain organoids. So for example, if you have some specific questions about some really detailed uh, cellular mechanism of human brain development, or you're interested in some really um, complex uh, cellular heterogeneity or complexity of human SVZ, for example, then you do need human brain organoids. However, their complexity comes with a cost. They are highly variable. So if you have a look in this diagram, uh, you can see only some. So this is only some of the factors that influence variability in tissue culture. And here I'm actually talking about standard tissue culture. So cell lines, I mean, your primary cell lines or your, uh, your, even your HeLa. And all of these parameters, and there's probably many more of them, can have a profound influence on your readout. And um, uh, especially when you're taking cells further into an organoid uh, generation protocol, these issues just they get augmented. So when we are making organoids, there are different organoid generation protocols, whether you have directed versus undirected and type and the, the amount of small molecules that you are using, the starting number of cells, which is influenced by cell death, um, so uh, also some of our media are not, is not fully defined, even though this uh, aspect has been addressed quite well. I will mention that later. Uh, so laboratory equipment can be different between labs, can be older, can be new. And a very, very important one is the researcher's experience. So all of these parameters together <laughs> with what we have in, in the tissue culture in general lead to a really high organoid variability. So let me show you some examples of organoid variability in our brain organoids. So just start with a very brief overview of the protocol or the organoid generation protocol that we most commonly use. So we put our organoids through uh, several media changes to induce a new ectodermal identity. And then we embed them in a droplet of matrigel. And this induces budding of the new epithelial tissue. And that is actually our tissue of interest. We also, so we further maintain our organoids on an orbital shaker. And this encourages oxygen and nutrient exchange. And in this way, we can culture brain organoids for many months. So, and here is a picture of a very beautiful brain organoid from uh, the, our favorite cell line, which is called H9. It is an embryonic stem cell line. And as you can see, it is covered with neuroepithelial um, buds. And this is what we like to see. And if you remember from my previous slide, so over there in the top left was the cell line was the one of the main sources of variability in general in tissue culture. And when we work with brain organoids, this, this variability is even enhanced. So here are organoids that were produced on the same day as these, with the same protocol, but from a different cell line. As you can see, this is a cell line called H1, and this is a cell line called BURB, <laughs> BURB1. And it is quite obvious to see that these don't produce good organoids. So the reasons why some cell lines are good and some are bad, if you can put it in the quotation marks, when it comes to production of a specific organoid type are still unclear. But Magda Sutcliffe in our lab is actively working on this question, and she's trying to understand the background of why uh, some of these cell lines are good and some are bad, but also what is very important is how to make the bad cell lines good, which would be very, very useful, especially when it comes to induced pluripotent cell lines. So another very irritating source of variability in organoids is the batch effect. Again, here is, here is this the same um, beautiful organoid from our favorite cell line. But the, here are more organoids made out of the same cell lines using the same organoid protocol, but on a different day. So as you can see, they look quite different and they don't look that nice. So uh, even though the batch effect is usually smaller than the cell line effect, especially when you compare, let's say, RNA sequencing, it can have very significant effects on your results. So the batch effect is difficult to avoid, but there are some guidelines and some tips and tricks on how to recognize the good from the bad batch. And also how you can try to direct your maybe batch that is starting to look bad, how you can try and direct it to look good. So first of all, in my troubleshooting points would be know the tissue you are modeling. So this is crucial. You simply have to know what are you looking for in order to uh, know how to recognize the good from the bad organoid. So we work on human brain development models. And just to show you what the in vivo tissue looks like. So this is just what an embryonic brain looks like. And this is a section like this, so coronal section. And we are particularly interested in this part of the brain, which is the dolson telencephalon. And here is the neuroepithelium. And this is what the neuroepithelium looks like at around um, eight or nine uh, gestation weeks in, in vivo. And this is one of our organoids. And as you can see, this is at 60 days. This organoid has very similar morphological uh, zone as the real tissue. So 
how to get to know your tissues. So go back to uh, um, uh, anatomical atlases, go back to old atlases, go back to classical papers, go back to drawings and go back to all the different in vivo papers of different species and get to familiarize yourself with the tissue that you are trying to model. Again, if you don't know what the tissue looks like in, in, in an embryo, it, is very, it would be very difficult to, uh, to learn how to recognize all of these crucial morphological zones and morphological features that would make your organoid good or bad. And again, morphology, morphology is crucial because if your morphology is not right and is wrong, it will most probably have an effect on your cellular identity. So once you have established that you have good morphology, that is not the end of it. You always have to check the identity of your tissue. So let's say here you have a lovely ventricle and it is positive for TBR2, which is a marker for an intermediate progenitor population that we are interested in. And let's say in another batch, you have another lovely ventricle. So this is the VZ, but it is not positive for TBR2. So what, why, why does it not? It looks very nice and it looks very healthy. It is because it is positive for a completely different marker, which is called DLX2, which is actually quite important. So again, if we have a look at the section of a brain uh, at eight or at 10 weeks post-conception, PCW, you can see that DLX is only present in the ventral portion of the brain here, here, where the dorsal part is a devoid of this marker. So even though you can think this is not that important, in this context, it is crucial because these two different parts of the brain produce completely different neurons. So the dorsal telencephalon, which we work on, produces excitatory neurons, while the ventral telencephalon produces interneurons that later migrate here towards the dorsal part. And if you're trying to study an effect of a certain drug or something on the production of excitatory neurons, and by chance you are getting, you are getting um, organoids of the dorsal identity, of course you will not get the result that you're looking for. And what is very interesting, sometimes these identities can appear next to each other. So here we have obviously two sections of the same organoid where we have two adjacent ventricles. One of them is of the dorsal identity. So over here, as you can see positive by TBR2, and the other one is of the ventral identity. So this part here, as it is positive for DLX2. So you always have to, in any, in any uh, organ or organoid that is supposed to be polarized in any way, you always have to check where are you in that organ because different parts of the organ make different things. So just to go into a bit more finesse when it comes to this, again, you can have in the same batch, a beautiful long ventricle with TBR2 positive cells. You will see me mention TBR2 very, uh, very often because that is our marker of choice. And then next to it, you can see again, a really beautiful long ventricle, which appears a bit thinner and there is really not too many TBR2 cells here. Again, we think it, it is because uh, the identity of these two ventricles is different with this one here being probably a bit more lateral while this one here being probably a bit more medial. And indeed, again, if you know your tissue and you know how, what it looks like in a real organ, so this is a mouse, I couldn't find the human, unfortunately, you will see that the TBR2 has a very similar gradient with the lateral portion being full of TBR2 cells while the medial one just having a very, very um, like small line of TBR2 positive cells. Again, this will have a very profound uh, consequences on your readout because this part of the brain, so these thinner ventricles, uh, actually does not have all the um, cell types that this part, uh, the lateral part has. So in order to um, establish what are good and what are good and what are bad batches or what are good and what are bad uh, cell lines, I think it is very important to have a set of parameters that you're always gonna measure. So for example, uh, in this case, I was measuring, I was trying to compare two different cell lines, in this case, male and female cell line. And I devised a set of parameters that I'm gonna measure to see whether they're similar or whether they're different. In this case, it was morphological features. So the thickness of the VZ, here, as you can see here to the right, the thickness of the SVZ and the thickness of the cortical wall, of the whole cortical wall in this case. And uh, here, just these rectangles show that they are, non -significant, they are not significantly different between these two cell lines. Furthermore, I have also analyzed the differences in identity of these um, different ventricles of different cell lines, for example, in the number of, numbers of neurons that these organoids produce, but also in the numbers of TBR2 or intermediate progenitors that they produce. And again, I have established that there is no difference. So this is crucial when comparing different cell lines, uh, organoids of different cell, cell lines, but it can also be very important when comparing different batches. So if you are trying to see um, how variable are the organoids of the cell line that you are producing. So just think about some of the parameters of your organoids that could be, you could have like a little list and go through that list uh, when you are, um, when you're doing your trial experiments in establishing, in learning how to work with your cell line and establishing, establishing the variability in your cell lines. 
So um, the last three or four slides that I have shown you were kind of an what can an individual research do, research do to try and make your own organoids, in this case, brain organoids, more reproducible. But I would like to just mention a few communal solutions, which we as an organoid community could try and do to make organoids as a whole field a bit more, um, a bit less variable. So first of all, a really good thing because you are outsourcing outsourcing quality assurance and quality control to our industry partners. So several different biotech companies have started producing uh, organoid generation kits. And this is really good, first of all, because they work really, really well. But second, because their quality insurance and quality control are much more stringent than what you would, what you would usually have in a basic research lab. So even though uh, they do tend to cost a bit more money, unfortunately, but on the other hand, they do make, uh, tend to give you more reproducible organoids, which in the end will, will save you time and money. Second, online communities are very important, especially now when we can't visit each other. So for example, for our brain organoid community, we have a Google group to which uh, individual researchers, researchers can submit their questions and also give us pictures of their organoids if they're having some problems. And usually somebody will come and help them. Uh, especially this is also interesting, uh, important now, as I said, again, when we can't visit each other to um, record and post videos of, of the, our tissue culture practice, because it is very often these little tips and tricks that help you and, and can make a really big difference between a good and a bad organoid badge or really teach you how to make organoids. And third, uh, and this is where actually the tumor organoid field has already been quite advanced, is the bio, our biobanks of tested cell lines and organoids. And for example, there already exist several biobanks of, I think, colonorectal organoids, excuse me, in which they have taken um, organoids generated from patient samples, and they're available to anybody who wants to do some like therapeutic drug or CRISPR screens. So it would be really useful if uh, we could find like a, an organize, an organized biobank in which we could deposit cell lines that we know work for a given protocol, or even frozen organoids that individual researchers could, could use. So this not only will boost reproducibility in the organoid field, but will definitely help individual researchers and labs if they are struggling with starting with their organoid work. So just to answer the question, my title question, in how we can make 3D models more reproducible. So it is very important first to choose your model depending on the scientific question. So you might not even need the 3D model in which you have to fight with the reproducibility, with the greater uh, variability. You might be able to use something a bit simpler. If you do need to use organoid, it is very important to get trained by an experienced researcher because, as I said, there are many, many tips and tricks that will help you. Think of statistics in advance and plan for redundancies. As I mentioned, a uh, batch effect is often difficult to fight, but if you plan in the redundancies, meaning that sometimes you will have to get rid of some uh, organoids because now you know how to recognize the good from the bad, you have to take that into your plan and always account for at least 20% more. So run a trial to determine variability. If you run a trial, you will have to produce less organoids because you will know how to, uh, you will know how variable they are. In addition to this, you will learn how to work with your cell line and how to make good organoids. What is very important, and I cannot stress this enough, is supervise your organoids, supervise <laughs> under quotation marks, basically look at them all the time. So it is not often enough just to make them and leave them to grow, you have to look at them. And here is where your knowledge of the tissue in vivo comes in, in, in play, into play. Because um, if you look at your organoids, you know exactly where the, sometimes you know exactly where are the moments when you need to do the next step, even though your protocol tells you do it in a day. Sometimes you need to do it half a day earlier or a whole day earlier. And sometimes an organoid that is about to turn bad, you might be able to save it. So carefully select the batches or organoids to analyze. So do not analyze everything that you have. And do not be afraid to re remove bad samples because a bad sample would definitely increase your variability and can really influence your result. And know your tissue, again, Cannot stress enough, you have to know your tissue to know how to uh, discern between a good and a bad organoid. And with this, I would just like to, th uh, to thank everybody. Everybody, so Madeline is not even on the list because she's here in the meeting with us. Everybody else in the lab and all the uh, past, present and future members of the Lancaster lab. So, and with this, I would, I would like to stop and take questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eva, that was fantastic. Um... And so, yeah, so we have about 10 minutes for questions um, and there's already one in the Q&A box. So great. So I'll, uh, I'll go with this one first. So this is from Susan Chalmers. She says, many thanks. Uh, from your images, it looked like different positions of sections within individual organoids had different expression and neuronal types. Do you therefore always post hoc stain for markers to check? Yes, always. 
as I said, I, let's say, for example, I'm very trained in recognizing a good neuronal tissue, a uh, good neuroepithelial tissue. But as you saw, even a good neuronal, neuronal epithelial tissue can be a completely different identity. So always have to take into account that you have to use several organoids in your batch that you are going to cut, stain, and check that that batch had the identity that you need. So you always have to take that into account and also add that time into your pro, uh, experiment planning. Great. Um, so there's also a question um, that I think really fits very well with the topic here uh, from Daniel Gonzalez who asks, uh, well, first of all, he says, thanks for the presentation. And then says, ta uh, talking about statistical analyses, what do you consider as your N in an organoid experiment? Is it every cortical unit, sort of every ventricle, every organoid, every batch of organoids, cell lines? Yeah, that is an excellent question. Uh, and that is one that we are always kind of fighting for and always thinking about when it comes to each experiment. So we have kind of come to a consensus that the N is, um, is the number of, um, in, of uh, units where organoids show the greatest variability. So in this case, if we are working with uh, one cell line, then it's going to be a batch. So your batch is your N, and you have, to, you have to do at least like a minimum, minimum of three batches of organoids in order to be sure that what you are observing is of any significance. So, but again, in order to know all of this, you do need to run a test trial with your cells. You have to get to know your cells and do any pre-experimental, so pre-treatment or whatever you are doing uh, tests uh, which can last up to a few months until you get to know your cell line and get to know your organoids and find out where this greatest variability comes from. And that is all quite project dependent, unfortunately. Great, couldn't have answered it better. Um, so there's also, I wanna just sort of go to, to one from an anonymous attendee actually, who's asked about um, uh, still sort of on this front. Of, uh, so they're saying that um, sort of, is there a need to balance consistency and homogeneity of organoids with kind of real world variability and, and, and actually is the variability that you're seeing not necessarily always a bad thing? Could it also be something that we could learn from? Yeah, of course. I mean, first of all, uh, the development itself is just a bit of a stochastic, um, stochastic process. So each individual, even though we have the same genetic material in our development, there was a tiny, tiny bit that changed in the early in development. It would have turned out maybe quite different. So, um, the variability, even though sometimes we would like to dampen it a bit, I don't think it would be good to remove it completely because this variability also, I think, can point to, to maybe an interesting developmental or an ecological question as the, as the, as the person asked. So yes, uh, I think what we would like to do is dampen the technical variability. So maybe try and minimize these technical methodological issues that we maybe have, again, experience, media, and stuff like that. But I don't think it would be ideal, and I don't think we should, try and completely obliterate all the variability that comes from cell lines and also from the stochasticity, I'm sorry, I can't even pronounce that, of the development of the individual, individual cell line. Then again, here is where your experience and your getting to know your cell line and working with different cell lines come, comes into play. And um, what I mentioned briefly is the industry partners that probably can help us and try to, to minimize this technical variability. Great. Um... Really, really quick follow up. What do you mean by batches? So batches are organoids that are produced from this from one well of your cell line on the same day. So that's what we consider batches. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And there's a couple of questions a bit more specific, sort of asking uh, about specific scientific questions that organoids might be used for. So there's one asking about whether they could be used to model, um, for example, traumatic brain injury. But I think that also goes to a, maybe a bigger question about you know, whether they can be used to model kind of environmental or sort of, you know, non-genetic uh, types of, of uh, effects? I think it, you know, again, depends on the question. If you, so I'm just talking, talking specifically our, about our brain organoids, which model early brain development. So if you want to model a brain injury that happens in an adult brain, then brain organoids are probably not the best uh, to use. But let's say if you want to model um, another type of brain injury, let's say, for example, hypoxia or something like that, that might happen during embryonic brain development, then organoids might be a way to go. So it really, really depends on, I mean, it's not like uh, embryonic brain injury cannot happen, but it's a much more specific question than, than like a general brain injury. So again, uh, pose a specific question before deciding on your model system and then decide again, you might be able to use a more simpler one for one part of your project and a more complex one for another part of the project. Do not concentrate only on the model, concentrate on your question. Mm -hmm.
And um, in terms of sort of brain regions, you focused a lot on kind of forebrain, but uh, can brain organoids be used to model other areas like midbrain or even other areas? Yes, so specific uh, protocols for modeling, uh, for generating different parts of the brain have been develop developed. So we in our lab concentrate on the forebrain and specifically on the development and evolution of the forebrain, but other parts of the brain have been made definitely. Yeah. So you just need to, and they are all adaptation of very similar, um, similar protocol, just with addition of, of different small molecules and different timing. Mm -hmm. um, and then a bit more sort of on the technical side of things, um, is there, you know, effects of the plastic wear and how do you deal with that? Yeah, most probably. So that is something that we in the lab have not really tested, but what we have noticed recently, for example, is there has been a shortage of a lot of things now during COVID, as I'm sure many of many of other labs have noticed. And we have been stocking different types of type of plastic wear for our stem cells. Now I'm talking about stem cells, not uh, organized in particular. And we noticed that our stem cells don't like that type of plastic wear. So again, this is something that you need to address in your in your in your trial um, um, trial project in your trial uh, experiments, and if 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 possible, try and use the same plastic wear throughout your project if possible. But yes, that is something that you do need to take into account mm -hmm. the the consumables that can be a bit different. So I'm aware of the time, so I think I'm just going to ask um, one more question, which I think you'll enjoy answering this one, Eva. Mm -hmm. So talking about sort of real world variability, what about things like race or ethnicity, age, gender? Should we be looking at these? Oh, yes, <laughs> that was one of those one of those parameters I have actually been looking at. So I personally have been looking at a male and female uh, brain cell lines and how is there any uh, variance in, in, in brain development? And yes, definitely, I think that uh, one should have a look at all of these <clears throat> and try and model normal human brain variability by using organoids. Unfortunately, that are all of those um, phenotypes or differences are probably very subtle. So this project would be very big and lengthy and require a lot of cell lines and a lot of resources. But I think it is, is really necessary that somebody does that. Thank you so much, Eva. Um, I think uh, if there are any, there is one more question, but I think um, maybe you can uh, potentially answer it in the chat or, or you know, later get in touch over email. Um, this has been an excellent uh, webinar. I've really enjoyed it. Uh, I hope you have too. And for those of you that uh, maybe came in late and didn't get to watch the whole thing, you'll be able to watch it on the YouTube channel um, later. And um, next week um, we have, uh, so we'll continue with our third installment of this webinar series. And we'll have Claire Jones from Talisman Therapeutics who will be giving a little bit more of the industry perspective and she'll be talking about human stem cell models for neurodegeneration. So please join us, uh, same place, same time. Thanks. Thank you.